Hello and a very warm welcome to this uh, next session in our Enhancement Conference. Um, a warm welcome to those who are joining us um, for the first time um, today and an equally warm welcome back to those of you who were able to join us for our earlier session. Um, I, it is um, the middle of the day here in Glasgow, um, but I'm conscious that over the next two days we're being joined by over 430 delegates from around 20 different countries and you will all be in your own time zones. Um, fortunately for you, um, you have your cameras turned off, so whether you're joining us in your um, full business suits or in your onesies, um, that is uh, completely fine with us. Um, as those of you who've been to a QA Scotland or Enhancement Theme event previously, you'll know that we do like you to feel at home when you're with us, um, and today we're just taking that one step further by actually inviting you to join us from the comfort of your own homes. So welcome. Um, we are looking forward to an excellent session. We're continuing our theme, our conference theme of learning from disruption, and this uh, session will have a focus on the impact of, on pedagogy, um, the impact on the role of the academic, and what um, those what the, the, those changing um, roles mean for how we might go about enhancing the experience of our students. Um, so I'm going to introduce our four panelists. Um, they are Professor Tom Crick, who is Professor of Digital Education and Policy at Swansea University. We are also joined by Professor Richard Watermeyer, who is Professor of Education at the University of Bristol. And Tom and Richard are going to kick off our session with a short presentation about a study they have conducted, and I will allow them to tell you much more about that. And immediately after the presentation from Tom and Richard, I will um, introduce or invite two colleagues from the Scottish sector here to engage in a, in a panel discussion. And those colleagues are Professor Claire Peddy, who is Vice Principal of Education, or Proctor at the University of St Andrews and um, Claire is also the new um, uh, theme lead or sector theme lead for our next enhancement theme and we'll talk a little bit more about that later and uh, we'll, our final pa panellist for the day will be Helen Gold who is Deputy Associate Principal at the University of Strathclyde. So there'll be lots of opportunity for you to engage with us, we want to make this session as interactive as possible um, you will have seen the opening slides um, with some information about how you can engage with the chat and the question functions um, in Zoom, so please do make use of those. Um, I'll be picking questions um, out of that Q&A box um, once our panellists have all um, completed their initial um, engagements with us, so we'll, we'll be looking forward to those. And you can also engage with us on social media and you'll see the hashtag we're using, which is hashtag ETConf20, but you'll see that on the template. In fact, you can see it on, my, on the background slide that I'm using today. So um, I think that's all from me. Um, do and sit back, and or not sit back, sit up, sit forward and engage with us in a very interactive manner. Make sure you use of that chat box. And I'm going to pass over now, um, I think first um, to Professor Tom Crick, um, and his colleague, Professor Richard Watermeyer. So thanks very much, Tom, over to thanks, you. Elsa. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and um, it's great that there's such a diverse kind of international audience for this um, for this set, for this uh, conference in general, but for this specific session. Um, as you can tell from uh, uh, Richard and I will be doing a bit of a team effort for this, uh, for this presentation. This is kind of basically built off the back of um, a major international survey that we've done over the past three months. Um, unsurprisingly around the impact of COVID-19 and I suppose this, this disruptive significant shift to emergency remote teaching and I suppose um, again aligning to the themes of this of this session around you know, what are the short and medium term impact to, to higher education there's a specific focus that we're going to look at in the UK but then more generally um, have we uh, kind of crossed the Rubicon? Have we ha have we seen a, a stark um, one way shift to um, HE delivery and um, I suppose the, the the sector to to practitioners to different um, disciplinary uh, identities um, kind of going forward? So we, we've got some interesting results uh, from from our major international survey, but we are going to probably focus a bit more on UK specific results. But then we'll we'll try and open up out um, which will kind of lead into the Q and A session going forwards. Um, so we 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 
decided to do this uh, this major survey. Uh, we captured nearly 3,000 responses internationally. It wasn't just on, against uh, higher education. We were looking at essentially uh, compulsory education, so kind of schools, colleges, as well as universities to allow us to kind of have this com sort of comparative piece. Um, as you can see from some of the results, we, um, we had a major response from the UK because we pushed it through our kind of, I suppose, our wider professional networks. Um, so was, I suppose it was a, a slightly a convenient sampling, um, but we had uh, over a thousand response, responses from the UK HE sector, primarily from England, but it probably broadly breaks down to um, sort of population um, uh, distribution anyway. And we had essentially representation across all of the major disciplinary fields as kind of categorized by sort of UK categorization. And again, across all of the major kind of career positions and hierarchy. So um, you know, as a represent representative piece, we had, um, we had full coverage from, I suppose, um, early career researchers and some PhD students all the way through to really established academics and um, people who are sort of professorial type roles. Um, I think Richard will come on to some of these points, but it's really interesting when you start to dig into kind of employment status, which we know is a certainly a hot issue in the UK, and I suppose more generally around, um, I suppose, the fragility and sort of precarious nature of, of employment within the higher education sector. So the, the challenges for um, how this particular this particular crisis has impacted on people, um, and you know whether they are full time permanent positions or whether they were part time or on uh, fixed term contracts. Um, as you can see from this, so uh, you know we uh, just kind of links back to the point I, I raised around uh, the career position and obviously the disciplinary affiliation. Affiliation. Some of that is down to, I suppose, our kind of professional networks and our, I suppose our underlying disciplinary identity. So, you know, and surprisingly, quite a strong response from education, social science, and uh, from computer science because that's partly my disciplinary background. Um, but again, I think we we were able because of the size of the responses, we were able to get a number of um, statistically significant results responses that allowed us to, to kind of look at those different disciplinary identities too. Um, so don't, don't want to spoil our paper that's that's coming out this week <laughs> but um, and you know there are there are a couple of links we, we, uh, we wrote a sort of a thought piece for, for Nature Index and also on, uh, on one key but there is a paper coming out in, in the higher education journal um, over the next day or so but essentially um, you can see from some of these headline headline points around the kind of preparedness for this kind of rapid shift, this emergency remote teaching, the shift to online learning, teaching and assessment, the challenges of the kind of confidence and capability to do this. And that's where that kind of disciplinary challenge came in. So, you know, where are the sort of digital competencies, the sort of the digital pedagogies and practice to do this effectively? The, the, the wider point around institutional support, because there was this, there was this very rapid shift to online, no campuses were closed. Um, people having to work from home, you know, potentially as you, you can kind of see there's a bed behind me. So this kind of, you know, the sort of environments in which you can actually meaningfully support students and, um, and kind of continue doing learning, teaching and assessment and actually having the, the access to appropriate tools, technology systems to, to do this. So um, clearly there's quite a, an interesting sort of disciplinary skew there for all the way from, you know, how could you do this with say sort of wet science labs and kind of practical stuff, obviously computer labs, and then actually the um, sort of perhaps more arts and humanities, social sciences, you know, how this kind of breaks down across the different, the different disciplines. Um, the kind of preparedness piece here, so I hope you can, um, you can kind of easily interpret this, uh, this kind of, uh, this visualization. So as you can see, the, the different colors represent preparedness, confidence, support and access. And you can kind of see um, out of a hundred where, um, you know, computer science and education of, um, I think computer science is an interesting result because perhaps you, you, there would be an expectation around maybe STEM disciplines to have, um, to feel much more confident and prepared, particularly access to technology and, and using technology. But as we can see, there's also uh, some, some very strong results from an education perspective and social science perspective too. Um, and again, this is how it kind of breaks down for sort of uh, for career position across the kind of career range from, um, I suppose, early career academics through to um, so assistant and, and professorial positions. Um, again, there's, I suppose there's not, there's not a huge amount of variance there, but it's, yeah, I think uh, as you can see with some of our, the quality, the quantitative data, there's, there is a lot of kind of balanced responses. And I think the, the real interesting insight, which, which we'll come on to is around some of the kind of qualitative response. So I suppose before we kind of lead into, um, I'll hand over to Richard, I just wanted to kind of pull out some of these kind of wider challenges around, um, uh, I suppose, particularly from my kind of research and policy interests around um, the shift to, you know, what does it mean, digital, digital education? Um, what do we do currently? So you've actually, you know, what, 
our, our ability to kind of to rapidly shift or to have a blended hybrid approach what's the institutional capability to do this and i think that's you know th this is this is clearly become a very very hot issue in the uk and, and i imagine um internationally so i think there is there is in the in the medium to longer term the kind of challenge around I suppose competence and capability of practitioners, the ability for um, institutions to meaning, meaningfully support this, and actually, I suppose for this session, that, that real kind of focus on effective digital pedagogies and practice, and that's just as important for learning and teaching as it is for assessment. So actually, this, this kind of model of you know quite perhaps a traditional model of delivery of kind of lectures, seminars, workshops, and then you know maybe sitting a two or three hour exam. How does that kind of shift into this online online world, and actually, how does that you know, from say a quality assurance perspective and comparability perspective um, work across the sector and I, I think that is that is going to be the, the hot the hot kind of challenge going forwards um, I'll hand over to, to my colleague Richard hopefully kind of seeded a few interesting ideas for um, the kind of wider q and I know Richard's going to pick up some of the um, the kind of the outstanding uh, some of the quality responses and also maybe some of the the, the, the thoughts uh, more generally from an HE policy perspective so I'll hand over to Richard thanks Tom if you could give me that uh, penultimate slide um, and it's great to be speaking uh, with colleagues today. I'm going to quickly cover and give you a whistle-stop tour of uh, some of the uh, open text question responses that we had to the survey, uh, and specifically to three questions which asked our respondents to reflect explicitly on how they saw uh, COVID-19 and the transition to emergency remote forms of learning, teaching and assessment, how they saw the impact of that both in terms of their current role, in terms of their institution and then for more widely in terms of the sector. Uh, so what I'm going to pick out here are a, a few of the kind of headline qualitative findings from uh, the survey that we found. Uh, so I begin with what many of our respondents saw as, as overall, and this, this will be familiar to, to many of us, uh, concerned about how COVID-19 and transition to fuller or full forms of online learning, teaching and assessment are impacting student numbers and recruitment. Uh, and there was real concern of, among our respondent base of, of the plus thousand um, that we spoke to in the UK with regards to the way in which this could uh, certainly cause a kind of downturn in terms of university's ability to recruit, but not only to recruit, to retain students where digital offerings and transition to digital offerings was seen to potentially impact the attractiveness of higher education provision, uh, both for uh, current and prospective applicants, but also thinking through about how public universities across the UK could potentially be seen to be at threat from more technologically advanced or adept higher education providers. Uh, and especially those, even though it's a small sector, but those existing within a private higher education sector. Moreover, there was some uh, concern with regards to the involvement and perhaps a, a increasing reliance upon the edtech sector in terms of the kinds of digital support it would be able to provide um, and the extent to which that might potentially impact academics' autonomy and freedom to teach uh, within that context. So, so significant concerns, concerns there in terms of the relationship and the expansion of relationship between higher education institutions and, and edtech. Um, a lot there in terms of the economic impact uh, of, of COVID-19 because of uh, projections of decreases, especially in terms of international students, uh, in, in terms of revenues generated by universities in terms of, of tuition, but also thinking through the, the impact of this in terms of other revenue generation uh, activities beyond uh, fees. And thinking therefore also in the context of well, what would the impact be to local economies where students don't materialize on campus uh, and not only local economies but also thinking about the significance of this and again focusing very much in terms of downturn in terms of international student recruitment for national gdp In a pedagogical context, many of our respondents, uh, in fact, I think the overwhelming number, and we frame this in terms of thinking of both the affordances that digital pedagogies and platforms provide, but also the what our, our respondents characterise as essentially afflictions brought about by uh, transitional, fuller transition to online learning, te online learning, teaching and assessment, was the sense of their own deprofessionalisation uh, and the dumbing down of pedagogies, especially in an emergency context where many people saw this as just a case of pushing things online, uh, of uploading materials and, and, and of uh, real concerns with regards to disengagement of learners. Of course, we would 
uh, take care to characterize some of these responses in, uh, uh, in the context of this being an emergency situation and of our respondents having to quickly move to the use of these technologies, often with very previous limited, with previous limited experience of their use. Uh, Tom mentioned earlier on this notion of precarity, which is well known to us within the UK higher education sector, especially, uh, and many of our respondents point towards uh, a fuller transition to online as increasing uh, their vulnerability in terms of the labour market. Uh, we've already seen amongst some universities in direct response to projections of downturn of student recruitment uh, of job losses, but also concerns here in the sense to which uh, increased use of technology would cause job obsolescence, um, that a turn towards more digital pedagogies would, would cause role invalidation amongst many lecturers. Uh, and subsequently also uh, a fear that, uh, that this would result in a kind of uh, stealth by universities, if you like, in, in, in providing an opportunity for job cuts. Uh, work intensification, which is going to be familiar for most of us who uh, now find that the, um, the separation of our personal and professional lives seems to be in increasingly uh, um, uh, wobbly and blurred. Uh, major concerns with regards to the extent to which people are spending time online and dealing with significant amounts of digital fatigue. Uh, but also the extent to which work intensification caused by COVID, especially in the pastoral context and the way with which many lecturers were now having to enact enhanced kind of pastoral care of their students, especially those uh, uh, international students who've been unable, for instance, to return to, to their uh, home context, and, and especially among those who find themselves uh, living in single dwelling occupation, um, single dwelling forms of accommodation. Uh, also related to that, real issues in terms of gender inequality uh, and uh, trends emerging there in the context of pastoral world, especially where that seems to be dominated by uh, uh, female academics uh, and which corresponds to previous evidence with regards to gender uh, um, differentiation in the context of pastoral care. The big one in all of this, for those who haven't been able necessarily to pivot their research towards COVID, uh, and COVID related research was the sense that their research is basically ground in, uh, has, has run into the ground uh, and significant suspension or hibernation of all research activities. And the implications for that, not least, I think this links Tom to the final bullet point um, on their academic, on the academic labour market where individuals are unable to engage in research activity and unable to maintain research productivity. What does this mean in the context, for instance, of academic promotion? but also transference to future academic uh, forms of employment. And this seemed to be especially acute for those uh, at earlier stages of the career, certainly those trying to make a leap between uh, doctoral level research and, and, and also for those postdoctoral. So a major implication there for ECRs. And overall, regrettably, um, and I think, but again, couched in the sense that we've seen in the last few months for many academics, uh, an emergency response uh, that, there, for many, there was a limited identification with the kinds of affordances that digital technologies afford uh, uh, in terms of going forward. Of course, we, we now find ourselves moving from the, an, an emergency context to a more kind of longer term or sustained uh, version of online learning, teaching and assessment in universities with some universities in the UK uh, 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 claiming that they will be going not only uh, online for large parts of their taught offering for the next uh, part of the academic year but for the full part of the academic year and with the potential of seeing online learning teaching and assessment dominating potentially through to uh, the very end of 2021 and there we have a few references to the publications that are directly uh, related to this the top one which is, as Tom's rightly said is a peer review publication which is appearing in the International uh, Journal Higher Education uh, which should be made available uh, in online first in, in, in the next uh, few days or so. So, so thank you, Richard. Uh, so just a, a couple of interesting comments as kind of uh, the sort of lead out from some of our uh, the, the kind of outputs you've seen there. So maybe it kind of cuts 
both you know there's some uk specificity some of these challenges but i also think some of these challenges are are kind of are resonate with, across internationally across um, all the different sectors that are represented today so it's kind of interesting the point around um sort of precarity and obviously particularly the kind of balance of roles between say research and learning and teaching and other you know public engagement kind of innovation entrepreneurship type roles but i think you know it, it raises some really interesting questions as we shift from this emergency remote teaching piece into perhaps the longer term and what does this mean for you know, from an he policy perspective what does this mean for for practitioners what does this mean from a pedagogic learning and teaching perspective and it's interesting kind of comparing to what's happening in schools because obviously we've seen certainly in the uk so huge profound disruptions there's a massive equity piece as access you know we make some assumptions about how people can meaningfully engage with with learning and i think you know some of these are the multifaceted and they, they're just as apparent in higher education but again it's you know the the, the challenges that we're going to be facing are going to are going to uh, you know they're going to be longer term than just as we go into the say next academic year i think this could be sort of a two to five year piece and that was reflecting some of the comments back from practitioners about you know the anticipated length of impact could be up to five years Thank you very much. I hope that was a useful kind of taste of what we've been doing over the past few months and um, you're very keen to kind of, um, to sort of obviously we're going to hand over to our colleagues now on the panel, but we're keen to sort of explore this a bit further in the, in the Q&A session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, um, Tom and Richard. Um, that was a really excellent start to our session. Um, and you can see um, Tom and Richard's uh, links to their publications. They were on the slides, but you can also find those in the supporting resources um, that we have um, published um, on the conference website. So, so do have a look there too. Um, I'm now going to um, invite um, our two other panellists um, to join us to um, open up um, their cameras and turn on their microphones. So I'm first going to come to Professor Claire Peddy, um, who, as I mentioned earlier, is Vice Principal Education at the University of St Andrews. And Claire is also the sector lead for our next enhancement theme, which will take us right up to uh, 2023, um, at which point we will have had two decades of our enhancement led approach to quality in Scotland. Um, so so no pressure whatsoever, Claire, um, for the next three years or indeed for the next few minutes um, as you um, introduce us to your provocation for this session. Over to you, Claire. Oh, good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you very much, Elsa, for that very kind introduction. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank UA Scotland for inviting me to speak today at this International Enhancement Conference and the opportunity to contribute to what will hopefully be uh, an interesting and informative panel discussion on how we learn from the impact of COVID-19, um, the rapid move to online delivery and how we use this opportunity to enhance the student experience going forward. I'd also like to thank the QAA team for responding so quickly to the changing circumstances and taking the focus of this annual conference to a topic which has got relevance for us all and at a pace of change which everyone in the higher education sector has experienced in the last few months but almost certainly not relished. So I've been asked to focus on the impact of COVID on our institutional priorities for the sector and as a part of that, uh, visit the impact on student recruitment, induction and transitions. Um, so on reflection, the first institutional priority for the sector is not perhaps one that might spring to mind when we think about the speed with which we have delivered changes to the mode of delivery in this academic year and how we start to prepare for next academic year. In my mind, the first institutional priority is to clearly articulate to prospective and returning students that the value of their higher education is resilient to these changes. We need to demonstrate that our offering is resilient to the mode of delivery and resilient to the location of study. We need to demonstrate that higher education is about the opportunity to learn with inspirational academics working at the forefront of knowledge development and expertise. It's about the shared development of critical and analytical skills in the exploration of the truth. And it's about coming to an understanding of evidence-based decision-making, the process of academic debate and development of informed personal views and opinions. In bringing excellent academics together with the brightest young minds, by whatever means and in whatever environment is available at the time, we are ensuring the progression of our society. However, it's clear to me that uh, young prospective students have more on their minds um, than the improvement of society. Although I firmly believe that this generation cares more about societal improvements and the future of our planet than any previous generation. 
As a result of COVID-19, this generation also care more about their personal ability to finance their education, their employment, uh, both during their studies and post-graduation, the non-academic student experience, and probably they care a lot about getting away from home after an extended period of time with their parents in lockdown. Their parents and carers additionally care very much about the safety of their child and the academic student experience, the mode of delivery and the perceived value for money. And for those from widening access backgrounds or families for whom paying for university education is a real challenge, realising this dream has become even more distant. The uncertainty of the COVID-19 situation and about how the university education will be in the near future has created uncertainty around student recruitment, both from home and international markets, and consequently the possible breakdown of financial models supporting higher education. Therefore, all of these important aspects of the education we offer has moved from being assumptions on our strategic plans to becoming institutional priorities. The foundational features of the delivery of our educational module, model can no longer be presumed. We are now bidding, building models of delivery for the next academic year that are resilient as possible to changes in the COVID-19 situation and any change in governmental advice. We are building programmes which enable students to have a mobility in and out of face-to-face -face teaching depending on their circumstance and to create alternative and innovative means by which all students no matter how they engage with their studies, can achieve the same learning outcomes. The induction and transition arrangements need to take cognizance of the fact that our students entering higher education for the first time will have been away from study for much longer than normal, and that students may be self-isolating, in quarantine, and or arriving at different times in the next semester. Institutions are prioritising the safety and well-being of staff and students while trying to deliver the student experience that are critical to their studies. Institutions are being creative in the utilisation of their estate to provide for the student experience, which comes as close as possible to that which is students expect against the constraints of social distancing, ventilation and self-isolation measures. And underlying all of this activity is the concern around digital inclusion, ensuring that all students are not hampered by their social background gender, race or disability. Equity of access to all modes of delivery must not be forgotten in this time of innovation and change. Standing back for a moment, those of us at the chalk face are all taking time to reflect on whether higher education delivery will ever be the same again. Many of us have had our eyes open to the opportunities that lie ahead and the surprising rate at which we can change when we're pressed. Can we capitalise on this opportunity to, to the benefit of all learning communities? Can we, I wonder, use this pedagogical shift to finally make the move away from traditional didactic teaching towards more collaborative, discursive learning? Could this rapid change herald the recognition of the role of academics as facilitators of learning rather than actors on a stage? With this final thought, I'm going to hand over to Lynn now who's going to talk about how these changing institutional and educational priorities are impacting on the process of management of change, the digital strategies, and the training and support both staff and students need to prepare for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Can I invite you to unmute your mic? And um, I'm really keen to hear from you. Um, Helen, as I mentioned earlier, is um, Associate Vice Principal at the University of Strathclyde. And Helen's a long time um, supporter of our theme. I think, Helen, you've not only been on our um, Scottish Higher Education Enhancement Committee, but also on our theme leaders group. So lots of, uh, lots of opportunity to engage. And you've been uh, engaged um, very substantially in leading one of our collaborative clusters over the last two years as well, for which many thanks. Thanks. Um, but over to you now. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Claire, and thanks, Ailsa, and hello to everyone. Um, I've just had uh, some construction work start outside, um, so I'm now wondering whether I would have been better taking the quilt in a, over my head in a cupboard approach that I know some of my colleagues have taken um, in the remote emergency recording activity. But hopefully the sound is OK um, for today. I'd also like to echo um, my colleagues' thanks to QA's 
AA Scotland for their invitation to be involved today and of course for the event itself and my focus and what I've been asked to speak about obviously is digital strategies a bit around the change process and also look at some of the potential implications for learning analytics and I can see that's already come up so far in the chat function. So what might be the impact of COVID-19 on the digital strategies of university? Well, I think we need to look first at what the existing published strategies across the sector say. And we can see that, as you would expect, digital is already commonly featured. To a lesser or a greater extent, depending on the distinctive identity and focus of each institution. But it's typically to enhance the learning and teaching experience, to facilitate flexible access to services and support, there are also plans to expand the portfolio of online programmes or develop courses in emer emerging technological areas and to develop students' digital skills. Beyond these aspects relating to the student experience, there's also an ambition for digital transformation of the business of higher education from a business process or operations perspective. And key drivers overall have been accessing new potential student groups and equity of access to education and maintaining relevance in degree portfolios and overall enhancing the student experience and providing more flexibility in time and place of learning. So connectivity is emphasised and the blanket term new technologies appears as a catch-all. Considered within our current strategies are the increasing demands on our students' time, with significant numbers needing to work to support themselves. And we also have a widening access agenda through which we are actively seeking to support a more diverse student body, for whom more flexibility within their studies is advantageous. Unfortunately, we're currently seeing our students heavily impacted by job losses, particularly in the hospitality sector, and digital exclusion is in increasing inequity, working against our widening access ambitions, and it's required direct action across the sector. And I know that digital exclusion has been a key discussion point in the sector level discussions that have been going on as we've reacted to this crisis. COVID has changed our on-campus experience and its distinctiveness is becoming blurred with other modes of engagement. And I'm seeing some of that in the conversation about online versus remote emergency teaching. So the familiar on-campus experience of before is unlikely to be available to us in the medium term. So how might that impact from a digital strategy perspective? I believe that time frame is the key change. In many ways, it's not changing the direction of travel, but changing the relative balance of priority activities. We are witnessing an acceleration in time frame. COVID provides the most significant driver for change that certainly I have ever witnessed, and I think most of us will agree on that. The normal rules for adoption and change process are to a certain extent less applicable, as we are being driven by necessity rather than other drivers. And it isn't the necessity of managerially driven change, but global change. So the option of business as usual or do nothing has been removed. In strategy theory terms, we're experiencing a burning platform or strategic inflection point. Change is inevitable. As a sector, this is the point where it's strategically crucial for us to focus on the opportunities rather than what has now gone. So we have the opportunity for our full portfolio of programmes to embrace the educational benefits offered by technology. We have the opportunity to decide what of the pre-COVID delivery we wish to keep when we're able to bring that back in terms of campus activity. And as a sector, we will benefit from a comprehensive update of our teaching practice and the innovation that this will then generate. So for strategic plans within learning and teaching, it may be the relative prioritisation and the addition of new opportunities, along with targets and time frame that are impacted, rather than the entire strategic vision. We will still engage in research. As universities, the focus that Claire has just outlined remains. In the short to medium term, what will be required for university's change process is visibility of what we're working towards for staff, or at least visibility of the process through which we will get there. And many institutions across the sector are implementing frameworks and guiding principles as part of the process of aiding staff in the changes that are happening. 
So changes to our teaching delivery are relying on technology, making success dependent on developing the skill set of our staff while supporting staff wellbeing. An effective change will need clear communication around the change process, which is a real challenge for us when we as a sector don't actually have clear visibility of what the situation we will be working within will be in three, six or even 12 months. We need to provide support to our students in developing their own study skills for the change shape of engagement within their studies. However, it's also the higher education environment that our strategies have been developed within that is undergoing change. And given the economic fallout that we're expecting, on top of the workforce predictions that were already clear prior to COVID, I believe we as a sector will need to place more focus on learners who are retraining and changing career. So these learners are more likely to require flexible, mainly off-campus learning that fits within their existing lives and responsibilities, potentially incorporating work-based learning. And they'll require access to undergraduate rather than just the existing predominantly postgraduate taught flexible portfolio. International and domestic travel is changing and it's uncertain how our students and our prospective students attitudes and expectations will change due to COVID. The personal experiences of our students, their lived experience will change their preferences and the university's agility in responding to this may be a potential area for competitive advantage. So how might learning analytics feature in the evolving situation? I believe it extends the value and reach of learning analytics. The potential data set is expanding in terms of the coverage of the student body. Learning analytics developments and innovations will be relevant to more programmes and more students. And learning analytics is able to make a fantastic contribution to pa support pastoral care activities, engagement and retention, helping us to better support our students, which would be particularly beneficial beneficial as our students are adapting to differences in their learning experience. It can also help us as educators to improve our courses, allowing us to review individual learning elements and make data informed improvements. However, it's not without risks. As a sector, we will need to navigate complex ethical considerations and ensure we keep the well-being of those within our learning community at the heart of learning analytics development and use. And I hope that our continued dialogue and collaboration will provide a sound basis to achieve this. And finally, I believe that our new enhancement theme and resilient learning communities could not be more appropriately timed. Thank you. I'll now hand back to Ailsa. Thanks very much, uh, Helen. That was um, really, uh, really excellent way of continuing our session. Now, um, just a, a quick reminder um, to delegates, it's great to see that, um, so much action on the chat um, box there, which is fantastic. And don't stop that. But if you have questions that you would like us to address in the session, please do pop them into the Q&A box. Um, uh, just, just the way um, my setup here works, it's easier for me to, to pick them from Q&A than it is to keep following the chat while we're live. So thanks very much for that. Um, what we now have as an opportunity up to um, around about half past two um, for questions and discussion. Um, so I'm going to um, open with the first um, question in the Q&A box, which has been upvoted um, many times. Um, and this is one that I'm seeing coming up in, in the chat box too. Um, it comes from Dr. Claire Garden, who's at Edinburgh Napier University. And um, she's observing that the, the move to remote or online delivery has exposed flaws in previous modes of teaching. So for example, the lecture, um, and that many have, have already acknowledged and perhaps begun to move away from anyway before the pandemic. So um, does this current situation um, and permit us an opportunity to properly challenge some of these previous pedagogical modes? How can we do that constructively and demonstrate that an online experience could be equally or it could be just as high quality um, as face to face and this is particularly in view of the fact that the media and, and maybe some students or the reporting in the media of student views that they really do just want face to face um, and nothing else will, will, will suffice. So that question about this pedagogical shift um, and the opportunities that it potentially affords, I'm going to come first um, to Richard and then I'll ask Claire to follow that up. Richard. Thanks, Elsa. <clears throat> Big question, difficult to answer, to be honest. Um, is the short response. I, I think what we're seeing here is, is a need to, for longitudinal uh, evidence capture, which some of the other delegates have, 
I think, intimated uh, as we begin to do more of this kind of tr fuller tr transitioning or um, greater, you know, what many are calling connected learning or blended learning and the rest of it. Uh, this, this requires long-term evidence capture and I think especially as we seem to be moving now beyond this kind of initial kind of emergency response uh, to a kind of fuller embrace of the affordances of digital technologies in, in, in our higher education classrooms for want of a better word. Um, so I, I think the first thing begins with, with a kind of dedicated study of it um, which in itself is going to be massively challenging because of course when we just look at the United Kingdom we have four quite different higher education systems. Within those systems, we have significant variation across our institutions. We have uh, some of our institutions that are perhaps uh, further forward in terms of their embrace of the affordances of these technologies and their own in institutional infrastructures are more developed. Others are completely the reverse. I think there's also uh, something here in the context of kind of cultural shift, uh, the extent to which we've seen the reaction, and I think we captured in the survey, of a kind of a sense of fear and dread amongst many academics towards this. Uh, how, how do we begin to challenge that? How do we actually begin to open up uh, fruitful discussions that mean we move beyond uh, the kind of agnosticism, if you like, or the, the dread factor that it seems to greet many? because of their fears of how this could be seen uh, and uh, uh, the substitutional effects of, of technology and the obsolescence effects, which we also see repeated uh, and which we haven't yet mentioned in the context of, of kind of fuller moves towards digital economy, of which this is just one iteration of. Uh, and I think there needs to be some recognition there in terms of what also is the, the role of, of higher education and our universities in terms of responding to these uh, demands, and uh, especially as we see massive economic change in front of us. Uh, so I think there are a, a multiple kind of uh, a, a layered approach to begin to, to tackling this, but, but for sure, uh, it, it begins now and it begins in earnest, but, but this is a, a long-term challenge in terms of how do we begin to identify this, given the variety of factors that are involved here, not just institutional, and of course, as, as our own survey has shown, disciplinary. Uh, how do we begin to, to factor in for the specific uh, disciplinary uh, um, capabilities or non-capabilities? Uh, and I'm always wary of slightly getting into the, com the competency angle of this because there is a natural assumption that, that as, as, as we become digital immigrants as academics, we don't have competencies. Actually, we do. Uh, um, but, but it's a case of how do we begin to hone and maximise those competencies? So there's my tuppence. <laughs> that, thanks very much, Richard. Um, I'm going to uh, move over to Claire. Claire. Yeah, thank you very much, Elsa. It's a really interesting question, and I think it's a challenge uh, for us all to address, because um, I think the media. I think you're right. The media have uh, badged online learning as uh, somehow being a second-class way of learning, um, and I think there are as many different ways to learn online as there are many as many different ways to learn in person, and um, I think uh, we've just recently surveyed our students um, following the uh, delivery of um, teaching and learning online for um, for uh, for the last for four weeks at the end of the semester. And actually, what the students have said to us is, it's not um, the online that they that they that they mind. What they really want and what they love is the face-to-face -face aspect of it. And the face-to-face -face aspect of it could be online. Um, but what they really don't like is just receiving materials um, by an email or by picking them up from the BLE and then be, it, not being guided through on a, in a personal basis um, through through those materials and, and coming to an understanding. And, and it's a little bit about like uh, what I was talking about in my in my presentation, which is about um, that education is about a collective experience between the academic and the student. And um, sometimes actually the online presentation in a team's uh, tutorial group where the student is interacting with the member of staff on a, um, and the students are interacting with each other as well. Um, those that are slightly shy, slightly um, less likely to come forward are quite happy to come forward in the chat um, and ask a question there. So some online experiences um, and our students have validated that are actually really appreciated by the students. So I think we have a little bit of a marketing challenge ahead of us. Um, in terms of uh, explaining that online delivery is not all um, completely one type of delivery. There are many different ways and there are many um, positive things to be gained from online delivery. Mm. Thank, 
Thanks, Claire. That's um, really helpful. Thank you. And I'm seeing um, lots of activity in the chat around um, the terminology about digital natives or immigrants and, and so on, which is um, really helpful. I'm also seeing in the chat lots of sharing of links to other materials, which is fantastic. And someone was asking, um, you know, will, will we be able to share those later? And the answer to that, um, thanks to my kind colleagues at QA Scotland, is yes. Um, yes, we will. We can do a mix of that either through the conference website or I noticed um, my colleague Amy Everett and mentioning, we'll um, add a number of those resources to the um, Focus on Technology Enhanced Learning Resource Hub. So lots of links and yes, we will, we will share, we'll capture them and, and share them. I'm going to move to another question. Um, and this one relates to learning analytics. So I'm going to come to you, Helen, first, that'll be no surprise for you to hear. Um, and perhaps then um, I'll ask Tom to follow up. This question comes from Stephen Doughty, who's um, one of our international reviewers. So thanks very much. Delighted you can join us, Stephen. And thanks for your question. Uh, which is, um, is there any evidence, including perhaps anecdotal evidence, which I'm interested in how that works with learning analytics, but I'm um, sorry, Stephen, um, but is there any evidence that institutions who are more advanced in using um, learning analytics have used this in the online shift to better support students during this period of disruption? Um, perhaps um, this is as more data is available and students are needing support, is it easier to identify those students who are needing the support through the use of the analytics? And um, so Helen, can you pick that up? I would say it's a really interesting question. Um, I think we've not had time to draw breath for it to come out at sector level. So within the uh, Learning Analytics Collaborative Cluster activity, we actually had an event scheduled in Dundee, uh, which was cancelled as a result of COVID. The, the entire design of it wouldn't have worked um, and we went into lockdown. What we've actually been trying to get together as a group is think about what we do next. And one of the things that we are exploring the potential for is to run a um, Scottish Learning Analytics Summit, specifically to start to address some of the aspects that you know you're touching on there. What what's changed with everything that's happened in COVID, and what we learned out of that, and how is that changing how learning analytics moves forward from this, and what happens? Because I, I, certainly in my discussions within the collaborative cluster. Um, nothing's coming out even at anecdotal level because we haven't had that much time beyond just coping, which I think that is what we've all been doing. We're just getting on the cusp of the point where we go from coping to, to slightly worried planning to, to where it goes next. I can say from um, an institutional perspective, I am aware of how we've been able to use it internally at Strathclyde, where it's already been established. It's been very helpful in ensuring that people are still being able to engage and flagging up where there is potential problems and where you, you can make that reach out to students and, and in, look and check for continuity. Um, and that's certainly something that's been very beneficial for us. Um, so there is a massive opportunity, I think, for learning analytics. Um, it's making sure that we as a sector orientate ourselves to take advantage of that and also take care around the ethics side of it. And I did mention that in my opening part, but this, it's actually really complex and there's ethics that affect both the students and the staff involved in all of this. And it can be a very demotivating as well as a positive aspect of it. So that I think that's going to be an area that will focus on how do we go forward post-COVID in a, a new world. Thanks, Helen. So um, that's really, really interesting. So we'll look out and publicise um, developments with that Scottish Learning Analytics Summit as, as the details emerge. But thank you for that just now. Um, Tom, can I turn to you on that and yeah. um, using learning analytics to help yeah, no. Thanks. That's a really interesting question, Stephen. I think, um, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything even anecdotally yet. I feel it probably is a bit early for it to be kind of released, but I suppose I have it as, I kind of view this from two different perspectives. So in the sense of, I, I agree with a lot of points kind of Helen raised there. And um, I suppose I, I, the ha where I've previously been a director of studies, I think that kind of the piece around, you know, the institutional capability to have that kind of fine grained uh, learning analytics, particularly from a pastoral perspective and also kind of a learning and teaching attainment progression perspective, that feels very, very attractive. And, you know, whether this would be a catalyst for, um, you know, the, the shift to online would, would give you improved capability. I suppose with my computer science hat on and probably aligns to that kind of um, uh, sort of ethics, um, sort of legal data privacy perspective, I think I am still quite sceptical about how quite how these are going to be used. 
Um, I think there's a really important piece, and I was speaking to some of my undergraduates, I was sort of teaching a second year digital education module this year, which was, you know, very, very relevant as we were kind of stepping into the, the kind of the, the emergency remote teaching piece. But, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of, there was a lack of awareness about the kind of the capability, the learning analytics capabilities, and particularly how institutions are rolling st some of this stuff out. I don't think universities are necessarily being disingenuous or being sneaky about how they're doing it i just don't think students know and are aware of the potential ramifications of some of these some of these technologies so there's that co-construction kind of co-design piece about much more much better engagement with with learners about what and how you know, what types of learning analytics what data is going to be collected how it's going to be used how it's going to be stored you know and richard alluded to this point around you know there are some big tech companies who are involved in some of these things they're doing pretty well out of um, kind of getting all this rich data I mean, particularly in the school sector um and also i suppose i'm kind of concerned about just throwing machine learning algorithms at some of this stuff and just the kind of the, the sort of blind we have a load of data let's see what we can find out of this so there's a real concern about the rigor and robustness of some of the you know it has a very behaviorist approach to kind of learning and teaching and um and learning processes more generally so there's a concern about you know the way that we you know if we are collecting loads of data through vles um kind of wider interactions how that's recorded you know some you could even start to scrape students kind of social media interactions when they don't turn up and don't log on to, to your vle but actually i think there's there's this 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 feels quite problematic on a number of levels albeit you know i think just can as a sector there's been some very interesting work being done i just think it feels if it still feels like it's a long long way away from it having the the potential but again i think that some of that is around wider concerns about you know from a from a societal perspective about you know kind of algorithmic governance and transparency explicit consent what it means for how our data our kind of personal data is being used so there's a there is still a big kind of dialogue about how this is uh, how this is going to kind of work going forward mm. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's really helpful. I'm going to uh, move it sticking with um, support um, for students and I'm going to come first um, to Claire and then to Richard with this. This is a question um, from Kerith, um, one of our delegates, and um, Kerith is asking, how do we build resilience in the student population um, who are struggling psychologically and finding themselves in difficult home situations? Is anyone measuring this and building it into dual delivery? Claire. Um, well, yeah, thank you very much, Kareth. It's, it's been um, an issue that's been um, at the forefront of my mind since uh, our students all left to go home and then we're engaging in their studies. So th the answer is yes, we, we are measuring it. And um, what we found, which is quite interesting, is that um, perhaps the body of students that are present in um, St Andrews would, would uh, there be some students that were needing a lot of uh, support and care from our student services when they were in St Andrews. Um, um, then when they were at home, they were absolutely fine because they were back in the body of a very supported family. Um, but there were other students who were absolutely fine in St Andrews and then when they went home, were, found themselves in not such fortunate circumstances and then um, needed some extra help and support. So actually the students that needed help and support changed, but they um, didn't, uh, there wasn't an increased number of them when, we went, when they went home. So, so that was interesting in itself. So we are, we've, we've put all of our student services online, so all of our support um, interviews and, and uh, counselling and everything has all gone online as well. So there's been a massive transformation there um, going forward. And that's actually meant that some uh, support has been um, outside the normal working hours of nine to five, which has also been hugely positive. So there are many positive things that have happened as a result of the situation um, that in terms of our student support. So yes, it's a real issue. Yes, it's a concern, but I think it's a changing concern rather than an escalating concern. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, Claire. That's really helpful. Richard. This is a huge one uh, because I think, uh, you know, if we start thinking about mental health agendas in higher education context, this is, these are issues and challenges that have uh, been increasingly prevalent and predate COVID. Um, and I think there's significant amounts of evidence and UUK has been involved in a lot of this stuff, but there's, and I've been dipping into some of it, there's significant evidence to show actually that the UK higher education sector as a whole hasn't been done the best job it might've been able to in terms of responding to a mental health crisis as is allegedly occurring both within its across its student populations and increasingly amongst its academic population. 
And I think COVID is a, provides a really interesting window onto this in the context of which, as Tom and I talked about through uh, our survey research, the extent to which this is um, imbalancing the relationship between academics and students in so much as the, the personal, pastoral demands and the personal demands are becoming more prevalent. Um, and I know purely anecdotally in my own interaction with, with my students, especially those who find themselves existing in single room dwellings and have done for sustained periods of time with limited social face-to-face -face interaction with anyone uh, or, or any, and, and with significant concerns about what's going on in their home contexts, the, the pastoral role massively increases. Uh, and in, in fact, I find um, myself and talking to many colleagues across many universities, speaking of the extent to which they find their support of students' academic studies is increasingly diverted towards supporting them socially, emotionally. Uh, and that has significant impact, uh, I think, not least in terms of us as academics, where we're finding the work intensification around this and, and, and the sense of that while digital uh, provides increased access and can be seen to be you know, better connectivity and, and perhaps more inclusivity, places huge amounts of demand where uh, academics are, are now increasingly on call uh, and we're always on call, especially when we're dealing with uh, uh, an international student cohort who might be anywhere at the world at any one point and who are increasingly uh, frightened, many of them are, uh, and perhaps that question of resilience. We, we shouldn't make so much assumption in terms of our students' resilience. They are, there are many of them, as we, are we as an academic workforce, vulnerable. Um, I think also in the context uh, of uh, mental health in international, uh, amongst international students, is this uh, concern around non-disclosure. There will be many because of the cultural uh, um, construction of mental health, who will not disclose. Uh, uh, and what then, and what is our response then as a sector in terms of accommodating for those individuals' needs? So I think there are broader questions here that relate to the kind of intersection of an internationalization agenda for universities, which of course has been rampant in the UK, uh, and the extent to which that um, conjoins with how we provide in the best possible ways the kinds of infrastructures which, which aren't the best, where we've seen you know, significant take up by academics because student support services are so overwhelmed by the needs from students. Uh, uh, and that extends even into NHS supply for this. Um, how do we redress the balance? How do we provide more of what's increasingly been spoken of as whole institutional approaches to this? And maybe even a whole higher education community approach to this. Um, so I think, I think there's, this, there's significant challenges here. Mm. Thank you. Th thanks very much. Those are some really valuable thoughts. And uh, I can see my colleague Amy is flagging our session tomorrow um, with a student student panel. And we also have been running a collaborative cluster as part of the current enhancement theme, looking at um, student mental health and well-being. And um, so those are a couple of um, additional uh, potential resources or opportunities to engage. Um, I'm going to move to a question from a, a PhD student here and I'm going to take views um, from right across the panel, perhaps starting with Claire um, and then moving to Tom in the first instance. Um, this is from Natalie and she's asking, as a PhD student, how can we prepare ourselves for the new academic or other research labour market? A really good question there. Um, Claire, can I turn to you first? Yeah, that's a, a really, really good question, and it is um, a huge challenge going forward. And the, there are, you know, there are many, many programs that PhD students can engage with to, to prepare themselves for um, the, the labour market. But clearly, there are going to be additional challenges into entering this labour market going ahead. So there, um, <laughs> so I think um, PhD students are. It, there's a tendency for PhD students to immerse themselves completely in their PhD and spend a huge amount of time on their PhD. Um, but they do need to engage with um, casting around to look at their own attributes, look at their own personal skills and, and write um, for themselves a reflective piece on where they are. And then uh, look cast around to find opportunities to develop the skills that they need that are not necessarily central to their PhD development. So there's a, there's a huge amount of work um, that could be done there. Um, there's many institutions now are putting a lot of work into um, postgraduate and employability skills. I think it's perhaps been an area that the sector has been a little bit reticent in developing going forward. And I think there's a huge amount of work for us to do in supporting the PhD student going forward. I think as a sector, quite often in research intensive universities, especially, there's been a tendency to believe that all PhD students are going to go on to academic careers. 
but clearly the, the data reflects the fact that, fact that that's not true. So we need to make sure that institutionally and sector-wide we provide um, PhD students with these opportunities to develop their skills outside the central focus of their PhD programme. Mm, yeah, so that focus on interdisciplinary activity or um, mm. core skills or um, whatever we might, um, however, whatever language we might use to describe it. Thank you, Claire. Um, Tom. Yeah, I'm delighted Claire had answered that first. Um, I, mean, I, think, I mean, I mean, that is a that is a, a fantastic question by Natalie, and I think um, Richard and I we've we've spoken about this quite a lot over when we're kind of going through the data from the survey because I think we we kind of reflected saying, you know, it's partly because of the the the, the challenges of the kind of COVID the impact of COVID nineteen on on the university sector in the UK was this was not a very fun time to be finishing a PhD and looking for a permanent academic position more generally. And I would say it's interesting when you've seen um, the postponement of REF and then you've seen, um, you know, much more, hopefully much more reflection of these kind of national scale kind of policy levers, things like excellence framework. So we've seen TEF level three being um, sort of sidelined. So subject level TEF, like what does that mean for kind of the, the wider piece for these quite expensive burdensome national exercises um, to a, a, to kind of measure and weigh the kind of quality of, of stuff that's going on in universities. Um, that has a massive skewing effect on when you might finish your PhD and when you might be able to get a permanent faculty position. So I think, you know, perhaps this, you know, perhaps bit idealistically perhaps this will reflect on you know quite how we do some of this stuff going forward because you know the sheer fact that ref has been postponed i know there's been so much you know institutional effort but kind of sector effort on pulling this stuff together but actually how beneficial is it what, what benefit you know what, what what are the rewards from doing this very expensive exercise every eight years i think specifically for um you know claire covers some really kind of key points there around you know what looking at doctoral training particularly how it's funded and its sustainability so you know like how long is it funded what's the transition from ug to pgt and obviously they're going to transitions after you've done your kind of doctoral stuff um i think that point that kind of unevenly distributed across kind of demographics kind of you know there's there's some interesting sort of intersectional perspectives on this as well too but also for some disciplinary perspectives like we know there's kind of a big challenge for you know, like national policy levers on things like STEM education and, you know, perhaps what that means for, say, arts and humanities and social sciences. You know, we're, I think, you know, I'm a, I've got a, a PhD in computer science, but I, I'm, I work in a school of education, so I try and straddle both of those areas. Um, the idea of actually, you know, the interdisciplinarity piece is key. Like, you, you know, yes, if you're a computer scientist or a scientist, but all of some of this stuff, particularly if you're going to go into industry, um, you need that kind of the diverse skill set and those wider kind of work ready skills to be able to translate those extremely high, you know, those, those valuable kind of competencies into a variety of different industrial or kind of career roles. So, um, you know, we, we've known that there's been a challenge around, um, you know, the amount of people who go through the Royal Society did some work a few years ago around the number of um, uh, PhD or kind of graduate students who then transition into uh, permanent academic positions, you know, the number who eventually reach kind of uh, to get a professorship, you know, I think it's about 4% get a permanent post, 0.4% get a permanent, uh, get a professorship. So actually the attrition rate is massive. And I think as long as that's much more transparent and visible, and it's made very clear to, to students as they go through their kind of um, formative kind of education, their career path. And, you know, actually we want to signpost and celebrate those routes, not, oh, they, they went into industry. It's like brilliant. They went into industry. That's a, that's a great outcome for a university. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to come next to, to Richard to um, um, see if you would like to add anything. And Helen, I'm going to ask you to, to pick up, and I know this question is particularly about PhD students, but I know that you've been very heavily involved in other forms of um, engaging with, with industry and perhaps looking at um, blending um, models between um, education and industry through undergraduate apprenticeships and other arrangements like that. So I wonder if you wanted to bring that dimension in when we come to you, Helen. Um, but first, um, Richard. Thanks, Elsa. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to this. I, I think uh, both Claire and Tom have pointed to um, uh, the, the, the clear and present issues that are currently surrounding the academic labour market. Uh, I mean, one can take a very quick, easy look at jobs.ac.uk to see the overall kind of contraction in terms of available appointments that are being made there. Um, and, you know, I think we've, we're have we at a time where, um, not just because of COVID, but the UK higher education sector itself has been played by a lot of kind of financial ins, um, insecurity or anxiety 
um, over the course of the last 12 months or so. And, and, and we've seen that especially related in the context of uh, industrial action as well uh, that's, uh, that's occurred across, across the country. Um, I think what's, what's we don't know at the moment is, is also the extent of, of funding. Um, and there, I, I was reading some interesting papers the other day in Nature with regards to, well, what are research budgets going to be and what a research allocation budget's going to be? And that's going to have a profound effect in terms of the, the knock-on effect of the availability of uh, postdoctoral uh, research opportunities especially. Um, but I, I, it's a hard one because I, I don't wish to seem entirely pessimistic, pessimistic around this, but, but I think we probably are, so especially over the course of the next six months, going to be entering into a particularly... Uh, difficult period um, for individuals in terms of seeking first runs on the academic labour market or even transitioning should they should they seek to be doing so because we have acute financial uncertainty um, and again of course this is, we shouldn't just rationalise this in the context of our own uh, uh, UK market what what happens to UK universities is going to be in, and the opportunities available there is also going to be impacted upon our international competitors um, and this is also an international academic labour market let's not forget and the implications of um, travel or travel restrictions themselves are going to have play into into this. Um, so it, it's it's a very difficult picture. Um, I, I think we need to understand this in the context of market competition. I think we need to understand this in the context of availability of research funds. I think we need to understand this in terms of the broader picture in terms of financial sustainability of, of institutions across the board. Um, because of course there, there there is a risk in this, and potentially um, if there isn't significant uh, or, necess or, or, or if there doesn't tend to be support provided for our university sector, there is the potential that some universities will go to the wall. Um, so what does this further mean in terms of the nature of uh, academic uh, um, unemployment? And, and regrettably, we've already seen across uh, the sector some institutions deciding to let go of people, especially those who are already existing on fixed term or more precarious or casualised forms of employment. Mm. Um, so I think there are significant implications here, especially there's that word casual in, in terms of a casualisation agenda for higher education. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think we'll um, move on shortly after I've um, opened to Helen um, to focus on um, the role of an engagement of staff. But, uh, but Helen, um, can I invite you? Thanks, Ailsa. Uh, and I agree with um, what my colleagues have you know, given fantastic answers here, addressing a lot of different issues. I can maybe look at it from a slightly different point of view in terms of some of the potential opportunities that might be coming out of this. Um, I think one of the things that we are seeing as a society um, is some difference in terms of your ability to work remotely. Um, and your requirement to be physically located in the place that you might be engaged in your employment with. And I think this is, you know, we're going to see that being pushed. The, the, if I want to work from home and perhaps only being on campus a very small amount, then that actually gives greater flexibility um, to staff within that labour market and how they also might organise how they work perhaps across different institutions as well. There are opportunities that might come with that. I don't, we don't know what they are yet, um, but that's certainly, if we're looking at a longer term career, I would expect to see that change the, the market to a certain extent. Um, but I think there's also opportunities that are going to come out of the changes to our market in terms of the diversification in the student groups that are coming in and what that needs in terms of the staff to support them. So we are seeing that we are going to be um, looking at people changing careers um, and coming in as adult learners, looking for more flexible engagement. There's a likelihood that there might see more in the work-based learning as the, the graduate apprenticeships and degree apprenticeships are, that apprenticeship style of work-based learning built within programmes. What that needs from the staff from the university who are engaging with those learners is a level of authenticity and credibility of the application of theory to practice. And depending on where you are in terms of your research area and how much that's practice focused, there will be, I think, opportunities um, in linking into these types of programmes as they come in and servicing those types of learners in the way that a traditional theoretical academic who's then been engaged in research and teaching but not practice to the same extent, um, that would be more difficult to have that credibility. So 
I think there are opportunities there, but it's very early days to see how this develops. Um, and obviously there are a lot of challenges that are going to come out of this for society more widely, not just our own sector. Mm. Thank you. Th thanks very much, um, uh, Helen. Um, I'd like to move on to a question. Um, this one is from Kath Shannon, who I know has had to leave the, the discussion, but I think it's a really valuable one, I'm sure, and I can see it's been upvoted a number of times as well. Um, I'm going to come first um, to Tom and then back to Helen on this one, um, because there are some other questions that relate to actually other aspects of model of delivery. Um, so the question um, for Tom in the first instance is from Kath is, um, my main concern is that moving to good online delivery models takes time and at the moment I think many staff just don't have that time that they need to do this well. How can we give staff the confidence and the time to make such major changes to the way they deliver their teaching? Tom. Yeah, uh, yeah, more time. I know. I, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, this is this is something that we have kind of seen. You know, probably perhaps reflecting on my own institution, but but more generally across the sector. I suppose if you have anything that hints towards digital education in your job title, you've suddenly become of massive interest to your institution. Um, and that's I think that, that's a that's a good thing because it, they're you know, reflecting on um, there is a huge corpus of, of kind of research and, and work and policy and practice in this space. But I suppose it also reflects on the fact that this has probably been, you know, it's not has been that important for many, many years. I suppose you, you can look back to things like, the, you know, MOOCs would be the death of traditional universities. That kind of hasn't happened. Um, we have a very well-established open university model, which, you know, is kind of is predicated on doing stuff um, distance and online and hybrid kind of learning stuff. So actually the validation of that model, you know, so you've got things like Future Learn, you have got edX and, you know, the, the engagement with some of these, albeit with perhaps quite high attrition and dropout rate, but actually people, the, the, the model works. I think the point that Claire raised right at the start around the, the, as if it's kind of axiomatically presented in the, in, the, in the newspapers and the news that online is less effective or lower quality than face-to-face. -face. I don't think that's the case. It's very contextual. It might be very disciplinary specific. It might be um, specific to, to, to certain learners and certain types of learners. And, you know, it might be a, appropriate for, you know, what might be appropriate for kind of taught postgrad might be different for, for taught undergrad. So I think, you know, the, the idea that, um, that, this is good and this is bad is, is far too kind of binary and kind of black and white. I think the point that um, I've always kind of wondered is um, why do we never see these things in job descriptions for academics? So, you know, the idea that we should be um, digitally confident and capable practitioners, we should understand, particularly if you work for a research intensive university or you know, your role has a significant component of research, the idea that, you know, particularly with things like TEF, the focus on students, student satisfaction, the measures and metrics of high quality learning and teaching in the UK kind of context. Um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen a job description that has an essential criteria based around high quality kind of digital practice. You know, you need to be, you need to be, you need to be able to put stuff up on a VLE. And I would just kind of remark that I don't think I've ever seen a job description for a lecturer, senior lecturer, you know, kind of any sort of uh, early career academic that, um, that specifies this. So I haven't answered the question, but I'd say, you know, I, I think the, the, the I, I've seen that shift away from, I think, you know, practitioners have made a massive, massive, you know, the, the impact that they've had over this very short period where they've had this dramatic shift online, it's been incredible. My fear is if like, because that has been done and there's been a huge amount of effort expended in doing that, that is the norm and that can be done very, very quickly. So the idea that you could just knock up stuff over the summer in preparation for delivery for September, October, or maybe January, that I think the idea that, and this is the point that I've made to kind of a number of colleagues to say, actually, if you are talking about this as being much more business as usual, that requires a fundamental redesign of your learning, teaching and assessment. So it isn't, I think there was, a, there was a great comment in the chat earlier saying, this isn't just about knocking out some stuff on video conferencing or recording a few lectures and just sticking them up onto the BLE. So I think, you know, that message has to come through that this is a fundamental shift in pedagogy and practice. And that would be very different across different disciplines. And, you know, for some of them clearly would have to be blended because I can't see how you do lab-based science over over um, Zoom. So I think you know I think th th I think there has to be a recognition that this was going to take time and it it's going to require significant investment. And I suppose you know a, a recognition that um, you know 
organizations such as Advant HC and you know why we have things like um, you know fellowship of the HEA and all this kind of stuff actually recognizing that this is an important part of people's career development and their progression and it has to be valued and has to people need to be given time to for their professional development and learning as well yeah that thanks tom yes i think i think we maybe come on to some of the disciplines of particular requirements um shortly um but helen i said i would turn to you i think then the questions about you know the, the time and the creation of additional time is something that we'd all like to have um, special skills in. i'm sure and um, i think um, the cath's question also links to one raised by jill mckay and jill i saw you you've, you were first to mention the student number cap in the in the chat so i'm sorry there isn't a prize i can give you right now but at some point i'm sure we'll um, We'll, we'll pass that on for you. Um, but um, Jill has a question that links very closely to Kath's one about how we can give time um, to to staff. And what uh, Jill is asking, it's just a slightly different dimension on it, where she says, how can we as a sector make real moves to promote teaching during this time? So um, what are the opportunities? So on the one hand, how can we make sure that we are giving staff the time it takes to make that pedagogical shift? And also, um, can we take this as an opportunity to really recognise and properly value sk the skills and expertise around teaching, Helen? I think it's, I, I, what, one benefit is, is it's, it's raising up how, how absolutely fundamental our teaching practice is to us as universities and certainly to us financially as universities. It's a reminder in terms of the priorities within institutions of a, an area that I think gets to a certain extent taken for granted. Um, and you know and is accused of not being seen as you know as attractive as as important there's always been these conversations around teaching playing second fiddle to research uh, i think coming out of this one of the going back to Kath's comment i think what we need to be really careful of is our use of language and there's been quite a lot of discussion about this immediately within the sector um, online is a blanket term that can mean lots of different things I, and there was a lot of discussion and it was really good to see out of what we did when we went into lockdown, the differentiation between that and online, because it wasn't what you, if you looked in the literature, what would have been online learning, what we did wasn't online learning as in terms of that pedagogy, not a pre-designed pedagogy for remote learning, it was emergency remote learning. And there's been quite a lot of discussions at sector level about whether it would be helpful to have more definition between blended, hybrid, you know, there's lots of different terms and they're, and they're used interchangeably to a certain extent. And I think what nobody's expecting is that we will, at short notice, over just a short period of months, create fully online courses that have been designed purely for an online pedagogy. But I don't think that's what we're looking for. And it's interesting because what strikes me is we actually know quite a lot about the types of activities that engage and work effectively with students in an online environment. I'm less confident that we know what the face-to-face -face looks like in a socially distanced classroom. And the blended part of, of the face-to-face -face part of blended, for me, I think when I consider my practice, if I'm looking at a flip, flipped model, what I would be looking for them to do in the classroom isn't feasible. So what is the value? And I think it's, it's reassuring people, it's thinking about what are, the, what are we trying to achieve with different activities and what suits it, but also having to be pragmatic about what is practical to do in the circumstances. And I think it's worth reminding us that online courses tend to be developed not by a single academic locked in a room, but by a team of people with professionals such as videographers and learning technologists making absolutely um, foundational uh, contributions to the design of those programmes and the design of learning. Um, but we have quite a lot across our sector now to build upon to help academics within that, that skill set. But I think it, we have to be careful about setting expectations for staff and not setting expectations that are too high because I think that's a guarantee to affect everyone's well-being. And also not the expectation that we're going to have every course sorted and done and dusted for September. Um, we are going to have to pragmatically think from a change point of view 
about a certain level of just-in-time development in order to manage workloads over the summer period. We can't possibly have everything ready for the start of the new term, but we need to have a plan in place. And we, we need to be rolling ahead. It's the old academic joke of being a few weeks ahead of the, your students in the textbook. Um, I think there's a certain level of um, making sure that the staff and how we mitigate the risks that come with that approach. Thank you. Thank, um, thanks, Helen. Those are really valuable um, points there. Um, I'm going to pick up um, one um, question and then I'm going to do a, a sort of final roundup, just um, conscious of time. Um, so um, both Megan Brown, um, who's from our partner organisation Spark, Student Participation and Quality Scotland. Actually, sorry, just before I move on to that um, question, I should mention um, when we're talking about definitions of what we mean by online um, blended dual and so on, um, I should say that my own organisation and QAA and UK wide level as part of our work to produce guidance and other sporting resources for the sector. We actually have a group of colleagues who are working on developing a taxonomy um, for this so that, um, which is not to get hung up on, on terms, although it'll be no surprise to anyone who knows me that I do recognise words matter, um, but it will help us if um, we are able to all be clear about what it helps us to discuss um, and to examine and explore the different models if we're all a little bit clearer on, on what exactly it is we're talking about. So that's a piece of work that you can look forward to come out, uh, coming out soon and those of you who are in QA member organisations which is all of the Scottish institutions and virtually all of the, those in other parts of the UK um, you'll be able to engage in the membership resources area um, if you want to, to be part of that project so, so please do um, pick that up. And um, so moving to uh, Megan's question, so Megan's from um, Spark Student Partnership and Quality Scotland, one of our partner organisations here. Um, and Megan asks a question which actually is broadly similar to one that Alison Tobin has also raised. Um, so what Megan is asking about is that um, are there some courses, however excellent online delivery might be, that these courses, because of their disciplinary content or the nature of them, just can't readily be delivered online without losing their central purpose. Um, Alison was flagging uh, laboratory-based um, activity, for example, and here Megan is referring to sculpture or other creative arts. And Megan asks, what does it mean if the learning objectives of a programme can no longer be met and students can't demonstrate that they've acquired the same skills and knowledge? So how do we um, tackle that? I'm going to come first on that to Tom and then I'll ask Claire to pick that up. Tom, I can see you're delighted that no, I've, uh, I, I, I I was laughing because it felt like a, this felt like a QAA question, as if like, well, um, having having been on a on a on a benchmark statement panel, I'm very aware of uh, of, uh, of this. No, I, mean, I think I mean that's that's a real challenge, particularly for can say creative arts disciplines. The examples that kind of that came to my mind. So obviously at Swansea, Swansea University, we have initial teacher education. Um, what does that mean for um, you know they have to be in schools? You know they're, they're they're doing their PGCEs. They need to. That's how they become teachers. So if schools aren't open in the normal way and we aren't able to um, to kind of deliver that that model, which is accredited through the Education Workforce Council for Wales that's going to be quite problem problematic for this next cohort of teachers who will become you know newly qualified teachers uh, next september and i think particularly from um i suppose like from a psrb perspective so sort of regulated professions uh, again at swansea we've got a medical school we've got us um we, we we have nurses we've got um healthcare professionals actually there's a lot of that stuff that's really that has been really challenging to deliver because they can't go into to, to do, they can't meet the regulatory requirements for for satisf you know, satisfying um, the, the, their accredited courses, and you know, and in fact, some of them have been taken and put onto temporary registers because they're working uh, in hospitals and actually supporting the kind of COVID action. I, I suppose I don't really know how we kind of get across that because you know, clearly, something like sculpture, I don't quite know how you would you would do that at a distance. That would be very very challenging. Um, and I think you know, I, I would probably reflect back on kind of Helen's comment around, you know. We have to be pragmatic and realistic about this. N not everything is going to be 100% when we can lead into September and October. I think we we recognise that there's going to be, you know, there's going to have to be a prioritisation piece. And I would also say, from a kind of, you know, thinking about some of my colleagues and you know, some of my uh, colleagues, I kind of have been having lots of Zooms, Zoom and team meetings with people are going to need a break over the summer. You know, they have been working very, very hard in the same way that a lot of other professions have, have kind of been firefighting for the past kind of three months. 
they are going to need a break. They've, some of them have got caring responsibilities. It's going to be very, very challenging to kind of blitz all the way through to the next academic year. Otherwise, you're going to start to see, you are going to see burnout. You are going to see some real kind of big challenges for kind of staff in a variety of different roles. So that's, that is a concern. Um, I, 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 I suppose I, I categorically haven't answered the question. I just think that we're going to have to be, we're going to have to try and be flexible for some of this stuff. You know, there is a real challenge if you are then saying, well, you haven't met the learning outcomes of modules of, of years or of programs in general. Um, but I think that means we're going to have to be a bit more holistic and pragmatic about how do you demonstrate that you've, that you've, you've, you've got knowledge, experience and skills, you can meet the kind of competencies and the learning outcomes of specific programmes. But there will be exceptions and I think some of the ones outlined are, are going to be, could be challenging. Mm, yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing already, I think, some quite, um, much as it is challenging, we are seeing some very creative solutions or potential solutions to how um, learning outcomes can be um, can be demonstrated a variety of different ways. And some of that we were trying to capture. Uh, when I say we, I'm talking again, QA UK wide in our guidance and supporting resource documents, we were trying to um, gather and then share the kinds of solutions that um, providers are finding to these. Uh, uh, and I would, I would say, I think that that's, that's really key, that kind of dissemination of best practice across the sector, because I think it feels like this is certainly happening at VC level because of the nature of some of the stuff and maybe kind of, you know, PVC, L and T level. Actually, how can we then push that across kind of disciplinary? And you know, I think that's going to be quite important. Like you said, you mentioned lab based science subjects. You mentioned you know, that's where you then need the kind of dissemination and sharing of best practice at the disciplinary level, too. Mm, yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm to move um, on to Claire, and I, I, I know um, that um, we were discussing just recently the challenges of a particular field trip for you. And, but uh, but uh, just thinking about the um, about the question that um, Alison and Megan have posed for these um, for for courses that have either because of their disciplinary nature or the particular skills, um, what what can we do about those? What do you, are there? Have you have you got neat solutions you can share? Um, yes, well, uh, I've been I've been uh, absolutely um, amazed at the innovation that's been going on um, across the sector in Scotland, and also the information sharing that's been going on at a disciplinary level. My own discipline, I've I've seen that biologists are starting to share innovative ideas about how to um, engage students in learning um, practical skills and. Um, and we, we have an additional challenge at the moment because it's not just the online learning that we have. We have students that are going to be face to face at the same time and that additional challenge can bring with it opportunity as well. So I've, I've um, heard of uh, practical classes where groups of students are going to be put together, some of them online and some of them actually in the lab and they can work together as a team, of, as a group doing the practical together with some of them online directing what the uh, students in the lab should be doing and, and, and coming at working as a team to work their way through um, a laboratory based problem. So that's just one of the innovations that I've seen round about in the sector. Um, but I, I agree with Tom wholeheartedly here that, that when, we, um, when we do come up with solutions, we need to share them. Um, for, for, the, for the benefit of the audience, my discipline is scientific diving, so I teach people how to dive underwater um, and, and gather information on coral reefs. And <laughs> so I am uniquely challenged in um, how I'm going to be able to teach that um, going forward. And I'll be able to teach the techniques and I'll be able to teach um, uh, the theory of the techniques and I'll be able to demonstrate them and I'll be able to show videos, but it's going to be almost impossible to completely replicate the, the underwater experience of actually conducting that research for the students. So there are, there are going to be some, some big challenges ahead. Um, I suppose the only thing that we could possibly um, say is that those challenges are hopefully not going to be long lasting and that eventually we will be in a situation where we will be returning to, um, to in-person delivery and we'll be able to uh, return back to those very important practical skills that we need to have. But in the meantime, there's a significant amount of innovation going across the sector and there are lots of development and some of those uh, really good ideas will be kept and we'll be able to use them going forward and others it, where it is clearly much more beneficial to do the um, skill in practice that we'll be able to return to our, to our, um, our way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So I think hopefully we'll be able to take the, take the good going forward um, and, uh, and, uh, and um, work across the sector to, to improve what we can offer. Thank, thanks, Claire. I, I was slightly surprised that you didn't take me up on my suggestion of asking your students just to run a really deep bath 
uh, I wasn't, she wasn't did. necessarily. She but, did. <laughs> um, thank, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time and we just have a, a few minutes left. Um, and I want to pick up um, our most voted question, uh, which comes from Don Martin, who's um, an excellent colleague we've been working with for a long time. And thanks very much, Don. I'm really glad you were able to join us. I'm going to um, run through um, all four of our panellists. So I'm going to take you in the order that you first contributed in. So Tom, Richard, Claire, and then Helen. Um, so uh, Don is saying that she appreciates the focus here is on the challenges we're experiencing. But did any of the panellists highlight or the respondents to the survey in the first place but do any of the panelists have unexpected benefits from the new circumstances that you'd like to to flag have there been other unexpected benefits or opportunities and, and if so what can we learn from this and I think that's a nice um, note um, on which to conclude and um, so if I can come back first to so be Tom then Richard Claire and Helen and that will conclude our session Tom Yes, we were, I think we were delighted to actually see some of the kind of positive, um, constructive responses to the, um, to the survey. It wasn't all kind of doom and gloom or just basically kind of reflecting of the kind of reactive emergency nature of what, they, what, what um, practitioners were being asked to do. Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave some stuff from Richard as well because we, we're both kind of going to dip into this. But I think that the thing that I found really that kind of resonated with me was, I suppose, uh, links back to the point I, I raised in one of the, the previous questions or, was around a renewed focus and kind of value a portion to things like digital education i know terminology sort of terminology is painful here so it's not just about online learning or it's not just about kind of digital you know essentially saying this stuff is important and actually it's not just for people who um you know this isn't just going to be delegated to your technology enhanced learning team or the the people who look after your viale or you know i suppose people whose job this is to do at the institution this feels like this is actually something that's that is is important for all all practitioners and professionals so actually you need this as part of comp confident and competent practice if you are going to be delivering high quality learning and teaching so you know that, that, that felt like a real a real kind of push to say this stuff now has has absolute institutional focus and it has prioritization and it has resources being put against it because it's kind of had to um, hopefully that will last for a longer time because we recognize that this, this is going to be part of the future offering so actually now you know it kind of does link back to the kind of slightly tongue-in-cheek about um, comment around kind of job descriptions but you know this this is going to this is a, ba a basic competency now so actually recognizing that this is about career development and progression and recognizing how it intersects your discipline or your own particular areas of interest but that that was one of the points that came through to me in some of the comments saying you know finally this stuff is, is being viewed as important and not just as a sort of nice to have Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom and Richard. Thanks, Elsa. Yeah, following on from what Tom says, I, I think what I found really interested in this, and I'm, I'm engaged in research at the moment, which is looking at, at, at specifically around the digitalization of universities in the context of fourth industrial revolution and massive changes to our labor markets, to a massive change to our global labor markets, total change in terms of the nature of knowledge and skills, total changes to, the, to what jobs are coming out. And, and I think what COVID has done and what a lot of our kind of digital transitioning is, is doing here is, is, is accelerating, if anything, uh, considerations in terms of, well, how do universities continue to be relevant in the context of massive global economic change? Um, and does uh, uh, an increasing focus on our digital infrastructures and capacities uh, in the context of this COVID uh, uh, situation that we're in, is that focusing what we do, how we do, and, and challenging us to do, us to do that better? So I think there's some, a lot that's useful there in terms of um, sharpening the focus and accelerating many of the kind of debates around universities' role in terms of labour market articulation and massive labour market change. And then I'm going to finish with a, what I, th I think a, is, is some might say is more a mundane aspect of this, which I'm seeing as a positive, but, but I think is, is massively important. I think that's on our, our work culture. And, and I've seen throughout this... Um, really great evidence of academics pulling together and, and not just academics but the entirety of the university community whether you're an, an academic whether you're in pro services whether you're a, a manager administrator whatever uh, i think there are, it's had a cohesive effect uh, in some respects um, across some of the institutions um, and i i think um, a colleague of mine great colleague at lancaster Gemma derrick wrote a wonderful piece in nature that talked about the impact of covid and producing uh, greater kindness um, and I think, we're, we're, I think there's an opportunity here for us to further embrace a kinder, more collegial 
uh, work-based uh, uh, environment. And um, I, I hope to see more of that. Thanks, Richard. Yes, that, that sounds like a, a very good ambition for us. Claire? Yeah, I and mean, I wholeheartedly agree with both what Tom and Richard have, say, have said. I think um, there's two things that I'd like to say. First is that I feel for, um, for most of my career, I've been trying to um, raise the importance of education and, um, and teaching in, in the university sector up, up the ladder of importance to make sure um, that not just digital education, but that even educational skills in the first place are on the, the job description of appointment of academics. And I, and I feel that um, we, we were making um, significant progress, um, promotions and um, on basis of educational um, ability have, um, have, have, have happened and they're happening now, which is fantastic. But this, this has just pushed it right up the agenda, which is also really good. My other point would be about um, nimbleness and um, management of change within uh, institutions. So I think we've um, actually all surprised ourselves about how nimble we can be when we need to be. Um, perhaps that that uh, nimbleness will um, will be carried forward. I don't think anybody would wish for the rate of change that we've had to manage in the last uh, four months ever again. But on the other hand, uh, we've now realized that it doesn't take you um, five years to change something you can change it in six months if you need to so I think um, I think that's a real great take-home message for me and uh, and I, I've been I too have been exceptionally impressed about all of the academic colleagues the way they've pulled together um, academic colleagues and professional staff within institutions to, to to enable the change to happen which has just been fantastic. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Claire. And yes, I would certainly underline that. Um, I, I, I think it's quite remarkable um, what the um, sector has pulled off. And the flexibility and creativity that have been demonstrated is, is excellent. It wasn't a great surprise to me, I have to say, for my um, colleagues that we work with all of the time, um, but it was wonderful um, to see. So um, thank you for that. Helen, can I turn to you for the... Um, expected or unexpected benefits and opportunities of the of the current disruption? Well, I think my colleagues have uh, taken quite a few of the ones that I would uh, have picked, but that's what comes from coming last. <laughs> um, I, I think for me, the diversification in the learn and the types of learning engagement that will better support different learners and the divergent groups, I think has really challenged the the emphasis and predominance on on-campus learners and everyone else that I think it certainly extends in a lot of conversations. There's an awful lot of focus on full-time on-campus and I think this challenges it a bit because it's blurred a lot of the actual practicalities of delivery around that that I think will open up and we'll be better positioned for the, the, di the growing divergence in our learning communities. And I also am delighted that we've accelerated the flexible access to services and support. So outside of the learning and teaching, the student experience is about all your engagement with the university. Um, and I think that it, it's been a real benefit to see how we've been able to leap forward on being able to engage fully in the, with the broader universities as an institution in the environment you're in outside of, of learning and teaching. And that's been a real success because all I've heard across the sector is how well that's been done. Um, so I think that's something to be very proud of. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I um, st um, now round up um, this particular session and round up today's activity at the conference? Um, I really want to um, thank all of our contributors um, so much indeed. Thank you to Tom, Richard, Claire and Helen. It's been uh, an absolute delight, uh, not only this afternoon, but um, in the run up to the conference as well. It's been wonderful engaging with you. And thanks very much to all of you. And um, thanks very much to all of the delegates. The um, chat, which I've had a little bit, half an eye on um, today, and I'm looking forward to reading through at my greater leisure. Uh, it's been really active and I really appreciate that. I know we haven't managed to get through absolutely all of the questions, but hopefully we've managed to cover most of the, the key topics. So thanks very much indeed. And um, so 
I think that really um, rounds up for me um, what's been a, a, an excellent um, opening session um, or an opening day in our conference. So this morning we heard um, from Professor Mary Stewart from the University of Lincoln who was talking to us about the 21st Century Lab project that she ran and one of them um, of many learning points I took away from that was uh, Mary's observation that um, we're, it, we're not just learning from, from disruption, but we're living with disruption. It's not just the current disruption, we're living in a disruptive world and what we need to do is learn to live with it um, and to see the opportunities as we were just um, uh, discussing there, get to see the opportunities that arise from that. And Mary was also emphasising that it's not only about our way of delivering um, that needs to change, but actually the curriculum itself. And I think that's something that we'll really look forward to engaging with um, through over the next three years with the next enhancement theme that um, Claire, um, Professor Claire Peddy will be leading um, for us here, looking at resilient learning communities. Um, from this afternoon's session, there are so many things um, that I, I will um, take away. Um, but I think perhaps particularly a point that was raised a little bit earlier, which was I don't, saying that, you know, that it's not just a case of either being in person or being online. There are very many different models um, and there are very many different learners and students and they will, so just as one method will suit um, one group of students then, so um, it may not, or another, a different method may suit another. So it's, I think for me, I was thinking it's about that personalization of learning, isn't it, that we've talked about before um, and really just thinking about, you know, what are the different needs and preferences of our different groups and then um, trying to adapt what we're doing to, to suit those. But um, I think it's a very exciting period and thinking about, about pedagogy, for me, I think this, it really places a lens on um, teaching and on the teachers and allows us to think about that process in a way that perhaps sometimes um, we, we maybe haven't or haven't always, some of us have, and Claire, you were um, emphasising that in particular earlier, but it really does encourage us as a whole sector and as a community um, to think about that.